you are in that. I mean, even nowadays, my mother-in-law will take the rolls off of our table and other people's tables. You can't waste. Waste is a sin. It prevented, as I said, the emergence of a black market, which would have developed and did develop in many other communist countries who didn't allow for this. And fourth, it gave essential pricing information to the commune itself, which is to say, if you're the commune leader and you want to decide to make a duck farm or a chicken farm, you go to the market, which is more pricey. Ah, chickens are hot. Okay, let's invest in chickens. You don't have that pricing information. You don't know what to invest in, and your, and your enterprises are unlikely to be successful. And fifth, this gave important role for older people, people who weren't making work points, who weren't out in the field, people who were retired, for kids who were not of working age yet. It gave them something to do. They would stay home, they would work on the family plot, and then they would go to the market and they would sell and they would increase the income. This was the essential location where Chinese families gained cash money. They got their grain from the uh, commune, but they got their cash money from the rural market. These are the only images of a rural market that I've ever seen. They were taken by an American who traveled as part of a delegation to Guangle Commune in Guangdong. And there are certain things to note from these pictures. First, does that look like a black market to you? <laughs> if it is, everyone's in trouble, right? Because everyone seems to be there. It's held in the Calissimo there. Here you can see this gentleman using cash money to buy a goose. This gives you a sense of what you could sell and what you couldn't sell. You could not sell grain at the rural market. That was, that was a big no-no. But other things you could. And you can get a sense here of uh, you know, the fact that cash was used and that uh, uh, livestock was available. Here you can see the age of these folks, right? Here you've got some pretty elderly people and a very young person. Now one would say, hey, Josh, maybe these were just uh, fake pictures, right? Maybe these guys are all actors. Look at their feet. Does that look like an actor's feet to you? That, to me, those feet tell me everything I need to know about trusting this image and it's, and, it's, uh, and it's truthful. You can also see here how many children are in the market. A lot of young faces here, too. This is probably, these two guys are the only ones who you can see who really aren't either elderly or very young in the marketplace. You can see, again, using cash, in this case, to buy a basket. So here are some conclusions of the research. First, I think it's hard to conclude the commune was unproductive. Look, I, I've got no bias in this. I was born in 1977. I'm not Chinese. I don't care if the thing was productive or not. Everything I've seen tells me it was productive. I, I know a dog in this fight. The commune increased savings via the work point system and Mao's collectivist ideologies, which reduced resistance to extraction while propagandizing development. It convinced people that sacrificing for the collective was the right thing to do. Just like when they pass around the tray in church and everybody puts a little money in it to give to the collective, this was the bigger burden. The work point system disguised income extraction by focusing members on the relative allotment of work points rather than total unit productivity. Incentives were generated by the insecurity then of not knowing the work point's value until after the harvest and through intra-unit competition among workers. You see that Professor Womack makes more but worked just hard as me. Oh, you better believe I'm going to talk to that accountant. I'm going to settle that deal. Because I can't make less than Professor Womack. We're about the same size. We work just as hard. Um, you know, it would be wrong. And so I'm going to settle that. How much money? How much productivity the total commune had? I, I don't know about that. But I know that I'm not going to let Womack's family make more than me. And that was really an important part of what the system engendered. In people. Resources extracted via the work point system were invested locally in productive capital and technology via the agricultural research and extension system. Now, many have talked of the Mao era as an extractive period where the cities extracted from the countryside. This is a common theme. And yes, that is true to some degree. But never forget that China had always been doing that, always extracting from the rural to the, to the cities. This was, a, this was time immemorial this had been happening. So what I would tell you is that that happened a lot less during this period. It's not that they took the foot off the neck entirely. They just released it quite a bit which allowed for most of the investment to take place locally. And of course, the local leaders, they benefited from local investment. They didn't benefit from investment elsewhere. So, their, so the goal of the local leaders was very much to improve their locality, and that's how they were incentivized to work. Private household production markets were an essential part of the system. They weren't a threat to it, they were a part of it. They were linked to it, and they were under the leadership of the commune. I think 
think is hard for people to understand. They always think of the collective and the private intention. The idea that they are working together, I think is hard to accept sometimes. So five development lessons from the commune. And now let me link this up to my other talk for a minute and talk about how China promotes development and what it can learn from this. First, modernize agriculture. It's not sexy. It's not like a big port. It's not a big rail. You can't stand in front of it and cut ribbons. But it is essential. If you modernize agriculture, then you are not spending your money like many African countries do importing grain. For every dollar you do not spend on grain importation, you can spend it on other things. The beginning, the first rung of the development ladder is one, educating young girls, which I showed you they did. A lot of those increases came from educating young girls and investing in agriculture. Second, a focus on the basics, agricultural modernization, but basic literacy, basic math. Essentially, going from what China was before the commune, which was a society of generally illiterates, to what China was after the commune, which was a society of literate people. Have you guys ever heard of the term Gutihu? Who are the Gutihu? They were people who came from the countryside into the cities and worked in factories. Were they illiterate? No. These are people who trained on repairing tractors. These were people who knew how to do basic repairs, and they competed favorably against urban workers. When they came to the cities, they actually beat urban workers time and time again. And my advisor, Richard Baum's book, has some really great anecdotes about how all these restaurants in Beijing had to get all much better because these rural chefs showed up and taught them a thing or two. <laughs> Double book accounting, also, that is really important here. By, by this is something that um, you know, allowed them, and in every single uh, team, in every single brigade, there was an accountant. Many people don't understand. The accountant oftentimes was the most powerful person in the team or brigade. But think about that. How many teams are all over China? If every one team has at least one person who can do this accounting, what does that mean after you break up the commune? You've got a country full of accountants. You might say, oh, a boring country. But still, <laughs> these are people who knew how to do this kind of basic accounting, which was essential in the future, the spread of human capital and ideas. The commune linked up localities together. And there's a whole series of stamps released in 1973 of the rural teachers, of them on horses, riding around, teaching. So they were circulating throughout. They were sharing ideas. The agricultural research and extension system is that. It is an attempt, it is an effort to share ideas as widely as possible. All hands on deck. You want to develop from the lowest level, you can't just say, I wait for the guys in the white coats to tell me what to plant. You have to be part of the process. And so this idea of all hands on deck, that every from, you know, Lal the Shal, the Nan the Nuda, everybody has to be part of the show, was essential. But what can this teach China about its current approach to the world and the developing world in general? I would say two general lessons that I've conveyed these to Chinese friends. First, if you think you're going to apply the lessons of reform and opening up to African countries, then you don't know where these guys are in the development ladder. These guys are much more closely to what China was pre-commune than to what China is post-commune. And I would urge you to look at the literacy rates of African countries, and you're going to see most of them are illiterate countries. 50% illiteracy rates in some of these places. You cannot take post-1979 development strategy and apply it to a country full of illiterates who can't do basic math. You need to start at the grassroots level and on the first rung of the development ladder. So my concern with Belt and Road is that it's aiming a little too high for a lot of these countries. You can give them a port, but if they can't read, <coughs> you know, the port loses its value to them. Large infrastructure is tempting, as you can see from this cartoon. People want it. But without a real socioeconomic base to maintain it, it can be beyond their development level, and I can give you chapter and verse about how this has happened in African countries where the, the political leadership asked for something, the Chinese delivered it, and it ended up being a mistake for the people of that country. And so I do think there are important lessons to learn here from this era that China can take forward, but that requires the willingness to accept these lessons. And gradually I believe that is happening, but it's a process, because it's very easy to simply refer to Gaiji Kaifang reform and opening up as the success, and to forget about these people who I interviewed who did all this hard work, whose hands were covered in, in, in cow dung in order to produce Chinese uh, uh, socialism. 
So, you know, maybe that's the kind of heartstring I can pull. For all of you Chinese in the room, if you have a rural grandfather or grandmother, you can say thank you to them because they actually made a contribution, uh, perhaps more than I ever knew before I started this research. So uh, I'll leave it there. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Yes, sir. I'm very curious if you have any ideas sure. about who yeah. the people were who came up with okay. these strategies okay. and were so successful at one point. <coughs> and where are they now when China is trying to help African countries? Hmm. I mean, I think a lot of these people are probably either really, really old or perhaps dead um, because this is a long time ago. Um, I mean, there was this real effort, and I saw it myself, I'm sure many of us had, to get rid of this history, to, to bury this history. Not to acknowledge it and learn from it, but to say that this was a mistake and to cast it aside. So until recently, under Xi Jinping, um, discussing this in China in this way, I don't think would have been possible. So during the Deng era, I don't think there was much effort to learn from this. In fact, I think there was a lot of effort to undo it. Others may have different opinions on this issue. But my sense is that these people were seen as a bygone era, you know. And the original ideas came from Mao or from whom? I mean, th there were a lot of conferences, right? There are constant conferences. The Northern Agricultural Conference is just one, but there were so many conferences that were going on, agricultural experts and people in localities trying to come up with best practices. I would say it's hard to say one particular person. The person most associated with the Dajai model is a person of some controversy, a guy named Chen Yonghui. And Chen Yonghui was the head of the Dajai, uh, Dajai Brigade. He rose to the level of vice premier and um, in charge of agriculture under Hua Guofeng. And he was a really important person, but his history has completely been almost washed out. He, he, wasn't, uh, he wasn't thrown out. Like Hua Guofeng, he was more or less shunted aside. Uh, but I would say he and Hua Guofeng, if you really want to find people at the highest levels, uh, Hua Guofeng and Chen Yonghui were the people who most associated with this kind of uh, development. But I have to stress, Zhou Enlai was a big supporter of this. Um, and certainly Mao was a big supporter of it too. Um, so, yeah. But, there, but, I, but it's important to note that this is a, a uh, people like Jiang Qing and hardcore radical leftists did not agree with this and criticized it vehemently. And if you want to see, it's really interesting. In, in my book, in the last chapter, I talk about the 1975 Dajai Conference, where Jiang Qing goes after Hua Guofeng for this and says, this is nothing but capitalism. These three uh, 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 freedoms here, that, that, that's just nothing but capitalism. And you're a capitalist. You're just as bad as that guy and points to Deng Xiaoping. So um, there's a politics going on here. And not every leftist was on board. But Mao had the gravitas. If Mao said, you know, Remy Gong Shu Hao, it's all. It's good. How would you uh, uh, react to, by now it's pretty old, Philip Wong's argument that uh, China was stuck in what he called an agricultural involution, which is the growth of productivity, I mean, the growth of product, but not productivity, in terms of product per labor hour. Chinese peasants have been stuck in a declining diet for centuries, and uh, the communists did nothing to change that because the family unit was simply replaced by the commune in which it was production and consumption. And that, that linkage wasn't broken until decollectivization, which allowed an elaboration of, of uh, productive methods that enabled families to create new forms of income flow. Um, that, in other words, it was not simply relying on family that you could uh, reach out, create uh, more productive labor units. So that it wasn't really until decollectivization that he sees a growth in productivity. Well, it's a great question. Okay, first, um, this obsession that we have with labor productivity is not an obsession that classical economists share. They're interested in land productivity. To them, that's the key, because labor is <coughs> abundant. Labor, as, as, uh, as Lewis said, is everywhere. We've got labor and literature are everywhere they are. But what we don't have is land. So the question for people like Tao Dukat, 
for people like Lewis is always how to increase land rent. And that, as I demonstrated to you, the Chinese economy didn't save us. And so that was really the answer. But I, 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 there's one thing that, that Bradley said at the beginning that I do take a little exception to this. I don't necessarily think that China should have continued this in perpetuity. I do believe at some point, breaking up communes and allowing these people who you've educated to move around the society has some real benefits to it. So I don't say reform and opening up was terrible, they should never have done it, they should have stayed in communes forever. I don't agree with that either, but I do. But I also think it's wrong to say the commune was a failure and, um, and we had a V-shaped recovery, right? Because we do know that China uh, gained a lot in terms of investment, as I showed you, um, during these periods, irrigation, education, right? So we can't, you know, Chinese, you can't overthrow the fact that that happened and was important. So, I, so my, my response to Philip Wong is, yeah, but so what? Because the goal was never to increase labor productivity. That is a neoclassical concept that just is irrelevant in this case to some degree. Now, what's interesting is when you go to communes in the late 70s, people talked about how many workers there are. There are all these people. What the hell? This can't be effective. Why? Well, I would give you two important reasons. One, if you have this many tractors, you just don't need that many workers anymore, right? Because, you know, I have a tractor, so you guys don't have to break your backs hoeing the field, so guess what? You get to stand there. It's not because, you know, it's not because we're not efficient. In fact, we're too efficient for the amount of workers we have, right? Um, and there's a second thing that I was going to say that will come to you in a moment. Um, anyway, let me, let me circle back on, on the second thing. Uh, okay, it'll come to me. But this, it's a great question, but I think that it catches us in, in a neoclassical idea that somehow labor productivity is what the Chinese were after. And I, I don't think that was ever the goal uh, here. Um, oh my gosh, in terms of the amount of people in the, in the village, that's what we were talking about. So you've got a lot of extra people, and so what you have is mechanization causes a lot of extra people, and then you need to free them up. So breaking the commune has been helpful to allow these people to circulate through society. That I would agree. Sure. Any students, by the way? Students, am I just excited? Yeah. To, to what extent did the failure and the, the human catastrophe of the three bad years yeah. um, uh, determine the success story that you're describing now? Was the model of the commune going into the three bad years uh, radically different from, or yeah. was it similar to what came out of it? And what did they learn from that experience? Now, that is really a great question. Because if we go back here to the um, to the administrative structure I showed you. The commune during the Great Leap Forward was a different institution because it didn't have subunits. There was no brigade and there was no team. And that made monitoring, did I go past it? No. Um, that made monitoring almost impossible. So you know, you've got this big commune full of thousands and thousands of people. I don't know you, I'm not gonna you know, say you should work harder, and I don't even know if you were working hard. So the ability of folks to monitor each other, and sociological literature is pretty clear. That limit is about 150 to 160 people. That's about as many as we can all reasonably monitor each other. Because that's about, say, 20 families or so, right? So we all can, you know, that's fine, and that's the size of the team. So this decision to, to bring remuneration from the commune level of many thousands down to the team level of a few hundred was a big game changer in terms of the ability of people to monitor each other. Also, I think the idea that um, people are not, that the political legitimacy of the party rests on our ability to ensure this system worked allowed for flexibility in the creation of the three small freedoms. Because the first commune, the initial commune, did not allow for private plots. It did not allow for household enterprises. It did not allow for free markets. The free markets were all closed. And so without those things, tensions emerged within the society. And so the willingness to go back and say, no, we're, we're gonna let these things happen, but we're gonna keep them under our control. We're not gonna let them go willy-nilly. We're gonna keep, that was because they saw that when they completely abolished it, it didn't work. So I would say that your question is right on the money in terms of understanding that without the failure of the Great Leap Forward, they wouldn't have known how to fix the problems. And then the one other issue, and this is a more controversial statement. This idea of all hands on deck development begins in the Great Leap Forward. It, it didn't exist really in China before that. The idea that everybody has to be part of this development story 
that is a great leap forward idea, especially the idea that women are involved, right? The, 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 the employment of women in this agricultural scheme, that is a great leap forward idea. So in many ways, that was actually quite an effective, that was something effective that they actually carried forward. Most of the issues of the Great Leap Forward were bad, though, and lessons were learned from, and adjustments were made. So that's why thinking of this institution as a monolith can be very dangerous, because it evolved and changed in, in important ways. I'll ask you a follow-on question to that. To be, so you're talking about the communes, but in a sense you're talking mostly about the brigades. So uh, the relationship between these three elements mm -hmm. of, of commune, brigade, and team, yeah. you have the sizes of them there, uh, and, and household. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the sizes of them there, but so many decisions were relegated to the team. And, mm -hmm. and uh, the question is, what did the brigade and commune add or subtract, or how did the system work? Mm -hmm. How did the parts work together? This gets to this idea of different economies of scale, not only in production, but also in the maintenance of capital. The big tractors, the big tractors, those were held by either the commune or the brigade. The shokutolaji, the, the small handhold tractor, that was held by the team. And those implements, the small implements, also owned by the team. So these were uh, ownership, these were uh, units of ownership. They could own property. And so by allowing different sizes of units to own different sizes of property, this then led to a, 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 a what's it called? Yeah. What is it? When, when, when things kind of work together nicely, right? Um, <laughs> synergy. <laughs> a, a synergy. Synergy. Yes, synergy. thank you over there. Um, yeah, so this synergized the system. And so that was important. But the um, I would say that the most important thing that they did was plan. So there was something every, um, you know, every once in a while they would hold called the Sansung Hui, the three level meetings. And the Sansung did not include the team. It was the brigade, the commune, and the county level. And the brigade, the commune, and the county worked together in order to come up with the plan at the beginning of the year and implement that plan and make sure everybody was on side with the plan. It was a, a smoothing mechanism. We all get together, make sure we all know what we're all about. Of course, when you get rid of the commune, you get rid of the Sansung Hui. You get rid of that meeting because you don't have the three levels. Well, you have a county that's gone the other two. And so this led to a very market-based approach. But the planning took place with a coordination among cadres of all these three levels. And that was an important part of the system as well. That when you removed, you, re you lost that planning structure. And you had small but complete and large but complete. What do you mean by complete? Uh, star chart, uh, star chart. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, to the extent possible, your unit, work unit in the cities or whatever would be would take care of as many needs as they could internally within the unit, within the copy, within the brigade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean there was an ownership that yeah. people had. Um, Self sufficient. And, and and this pushes back against a lot of what we think. We think Maoist China is very centralized, you know, a control idea. This is a very decentralized system, isn't it? Very decentralized. And you couldn't do certain things. You couldn't say I don't believe in Maoism. You can't say it. Uh, but you could do almost anything. Now, I, let me give you one example. Um, again, I go back to my mother-in-law because she lived in the institution. She and her family, on their um, on their private plot, uh, they they were they had eggs. They, they had a bunch of chickens. And the eggs were laid. And then there was a uh, the, the new leader of the team decided that he was angry about something and he wasn't going to allow uh, that uh, market to be held. And he closed the market. Now, what do you do? You got all these eggs. Then they can't go bad. I mean, that's that's a sin, right? You know. So what are you going to do? So what did she do? She woke up at four in the morning, snuck out of the house, went to the brigade next door, sat in the back, and sold her eggs quietly. Got back at home by eight o'clock. Was out in the fields, zhuanggongfen, making her work points. So this is what we call, you know, in Chinese, duizi or a pushback, right? This person locally, they can try to do something, but they also have to deal with the pushback from the people who live there, because just like the person who lives there has to deal with that leader forever, so does the leader have to deal with those people forever. They can't say, oh, the Womack family, get out of here, you have to move. The Womack family's here, their Hunko residence is here, forever. And that changes the way we deal with each other. You know, there's no, ah, uh, forget you guys, I'm moving. It's not, a, it's not a question, right? So I think that when we talk about games, right, game theory, 
it makes a big difference if you play the game again and again and again and again and again, or if you just play it once. And in this case, people played the game every day, all day, all the time. Maybe we could have one more question, and then we can break for further discussions. And of course, since we've been talking about agriculture, <laughs> yeah. break for food over there. And it would be very good food, too. Um, so. I, I, I'm definitely going to get you, but before I do, are there any students with questions? Yeah, and then we'll, we'll get you. Okay. So maybe two, because oh, I want to make sure we get one student. I'm just interested in your, uh, one of your conclusion as that there is a decrease of extraction from the rural uh, economy to uh, the urban economy uh, during the communes. So is that a distribution and investment of such as extraction? It's because of uh, the more autonomy of the commune in the political system or, or just because of, uh, as you said, uh, maybe so, the shutdown of the urban economy during the uh, cultural revolution? Well, you bring up a good point. I, I'm sure that the disruption of the Cultural Revolution may have made it harder to extract from the rural localities. I don't know how to measure that. I haven't looked into it, but it's a good point, and I can consider it. But uh, the main way that the urban area extracted from the locality was by undervaluing their products, by underpricing grain, keeping it low price in the market, providing urban residents cheap grain at the cost of the rural locality. But what they really couldn't do was go down like they'd done for centuries and, and basically steal from the peasants, right? They couldn't go and just abscond with that wealth. So they had to manipulate the price of the products that were rural products in order to extract. That's much less direct, and in a lot of ways, because of the work point system, it made it very difficult to extract from a locality. Um, you know, and you know, the, the whole point of this system is to invest a lot locally. Right? You didn't necessarily get promoted by kicking up to your boss in some city. That's not what got you promoted. What got you promoted was building an irrigation network, increasing uh, agricultural output. Right? That was the biao the, the, the decision was, did you increase agricultural productivity? Good, you're promoted. That's it. That was the most important thing. And if you gave a lot to the center and your agricultural productivity fell, that wasn't going to help you incentivize in the system. So. You know, I, I, it's th this is a difficult question. And Brantley, maybe you have some thoughts on this one. Oh, no, I think I think your answer is is, is right on. And, and the, the the negative the teacher by negative example was the cult, was the great leap forward because yeah. then people promised and then found out they couldn't deliver, and then they were caught short. And there weren't the the uh, self there weren't the plots. There was no individual reserve, and everyone was exhausted from the the large-scale projects mm -hmm. of, the, of the Great Leap Forward. Yeah, the Great Leap Forward, there was a lot of extraction. In fact, there, were, there are stories about going down and beating peasants, sometimes to death, to find their hidden grain because of these overestimates during the Great Leap Forward. But one thing I didn't mention that we should remember is that after the Great Leap Forward, the word went out to all cadre, you cannot lie about grain production. The entire stability of our country and legitimacy of our party is being undermined by these lies. And that was a statement that was put out. And when I talked to people, they were clear that after the Cultural Revolution, you might be able to skim on a couple of things. But grain productivity, you should not overestimate. Overestimate. Yeah, overestimate. You could lie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't overestimate. Yeah, exactly. Getting back to what I said before, you can underestimate, but we don't want to think that we've got more than we got. Right. Because then it leads to a legitimacy problem. Right. So in a, and this goes back to this gentleman's question. That was another lesson of the Great Leap Forward, right? That over-extraction leads to big problems.
you can actually produce enough food given the right conditions as we've already shown through the uh, provision of public goods. Uh, again, you know that incongruence between what actually happened in China and the way that the model is being applied to other parts of the world, that's, that's extremely problematic uh, going forward. So the reconciliation becomes expressed this to Chinese friends. I said, if you are going to accept the contributions of the first 30 years, as Chairman Xi has said in the first page of my book, I quote Chairman Xi, uh, he's my dun, right? I gotta use it out of my shield. So um, then, if you can accept it works for China, why can't you accept that it could work for others? And I haven't yet gotten a good answer. Because you would, you would think that, hey, you guys have accepted this. Well, why are you then selling something else? Why not sell this? And I have an answer for that, and I don't think Chinese friends are going to like it. But what are the interests of Chinese state-run companies? What are the interests of the Chinese state? The Chinese state is not interested in helping small peasants in, in, in countries do this. They're interested in the China, in, in, in building infrastructure. That's, that's where their incentives lie, right? That's what One Belt and Road, or Hidai Lu, or Belt and Road is about. And so if this is, this is domestic. As I said, this is local. This is something that these governments and these countries have to do for themselves, like China did for themselves. You cannot import, you know, uh, you can't, no foreigner that I ever know, I, I mean, maybe you guys can, can help me if I'm wrong, but I don't know of any case where foreigners showed up and developed the country in this way. That's not what happens, that's not how it works. It tends to end up like Britain and, and more of exploitative, right? And so what China's doing right now is very much in keeping with what is important for China. But whether or not that actually works for those countries, I think the onus has to be on those countries. So as I showed that image of Xi Jinping airdropping stuff, that, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. So the, there needs to be an, an effort to start with basic education, to, to, to uh, male-female equality. You know I mean, Melinda Gates has this, she's, she's right to tell. And until you do that, all of the great ports and all the great railways are not going to be enough to actually lead to a miracle like we saw in China. You need to have that grassroots effort. And that's, I think, one of the key things about this. Um, but how do you reconcile that with Chinese interests? I think that that's a different question, or a harder question. Thank you. And the question is, does, it, does this require a prerequisite? Does the uh, communism in China require a prerequisite of real revolution? And you don't do that for another country. Exactly. And, and, and that's really important here. If you don't distribute the land among the people, I mean, and then collectivize it, this is, this is just not going to be possible. Because Monsanto or whoever, they own their big land plots. In fact, China itself is moving in a different direction. They're moving in the opposite direction. They're looking at you know, large-scale agricultural productivity at this point. But we should also understand that China's in a different pocket position now. right? It's, a, it's got an aging population. It's got a different demographic. But at this point, it had a young population that was, you know, that was ideologically dedicated to building China, and, and Mao Zedong took full advantage of it. Um, one could argue, in fact, that the demographic issue drives a lot of this, and I haven't really discussed this, but the demographics drive a lot of this. This was a young country, because after 1949, just like in our country, you had a post-war baby boom. A lot of kids born in the 50s came of age in the 70s, and I'm talking about the 70s here, right? So this is a really important part of the story. And I'm glad that we at least touch on it at the end, because without those young people, um, many of them idealistic, uh, China can't pull this off. Well, the time is now reaching 1978, so we're going to have <laughs>